Hi, everyone, and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Two days ago, a group of people in Santa Ana, California, gathered to protest Orange County's new vaccine passport program. Politicians in Orange County are building a digital database of residents who've been vaccinated against COVID. Not surprisingly, some citizens fear that information could be used going forward to violate their privacy or limit their constitutional rights. No matter where you are on vaccine passports, those are obviously valid concerns. They're not crazy. If authorities in Orange County had decided to start a database of everyone who's been infected with HIV, or every woman who's had an abortion, civil libertarians and others would, of course, ask vigorous questions about why they were doing that and what they were going to do with the information. But with COVID, there are no questions allowed. So Orange County's Board of Supervisors just ignored Tuesday's protest. One of the supervisors, a Democrat called Katrina Foley, dismissed the protesters with undisguised contempt. Quote, they don't believe in vaccines, she snorted. And you hear that a lot. They're anti-vaxxers. They don't believe in vaccines. But pause for a second and think about it. That's a pretty strange way to talk about science. Science never asks us to believe in anything. Just the opposite. Science is a never-ending attack on settled belief, on faith, on what we imagine we know, on what we assume. Science doesn't tell us what's true. Science shows us what's true. It demands proof, not faith. So the next time you hear some smug mask wearer harumphing about how the mouth breathers out there in middle America don't, quote, believe in the vaccines, you can be certain you are in the presence of someone who has no idea what science is. You will know you are talking to a moron. But since we're on the subject, there do appear to be millions of people out there who don't believe the COVID vaccine actually works. Who are these people? Pollsters tend to miss them. If you ask 100 Americans, do you think the COVID vaccine is effective? About 99 of them would say, of course, yeah, it's effective. And they'd say that because they know what they're supposed to say. They watch the Today Show. They don't want to be punished for having the wrong opinions. They don't want to get fired or ostracized. But let's say you phrase the same question more cleverly, in a less direct way. What would the results be then? Well, pollsters at the morning consult just did that. Here's what they found. Americans who have been vaccinated against COVID are more afraid of going outside than Americans who have not been vaccinated. Much more afraid. Only a quarter of vaccinated adults say they'd be willing to travel to a work conference or enter a gym. Only 24% of them would take the bus. Less than half would be willing to rent a car alone. Only 34% would go to a party. Just 17% of them would dare to take a cruise and so on. The numbers are amazing. These people are absolutely terrified of getting COVID. Yet once again, they have all been vaccinated. So clearly many vaccinated Americans, most of them according to this poll, don't really believe in the COVID vaccine. What does that tell us? Among other things, it tells us that we have long ago left the realm of science and are instead in a state of mass hysteria and mass manipulation. Many Americans are too scared to think clearly. If you've had the vaccine, which you say you believe is effective, but you're too afraid to rent a car for fear of getting COVID, you're not thinking clearly. If you've had the vaccine and say, again, you believe the vaccine works and you're still wearing a mask, you're not thinking clearly. And you're not thinking clearly because you're too afraid. And you're afraid because you've been told for more than a year that you're required to be terrified. And the arrival of the vaccine has not calmed you at all. Instead, demagogues have instructed you to channel your fear into hate and turn it on anyone who disobeys their orders. The result is vaccinated Americans in masks cannot be happy or feel safe or feel any relief at all until every other person in the country joins them in getting the shot and covering their faces. That's not rational. That's not science. It's something much darker than that. What began as a public health measure has become instead an instrument of social control. We saw all of this on stark display just last night when we interviewed Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. Johnson has already recovered from COVID, like tens of millions of Americans, maybe over 100 million. Ron Johnson has had the COVID virus and survived. Johnson is not opposed to vaccines. He said many vaccines in the past. He told us last night he'd be happy to have many more vaccines in the future. He's for vaccines. But in this specific case, Ron Johnson consulted with his physician, who tested him for the antibodies to the virus. And like so many people who've already had COVID and recovered, Ron Johnson has greater natural protection from the virus than any vaccine could give him. So there is no medical reason for him to get the COVID vaccine. People should not take medicines they don't need. Ron Johnson has decided for these reasons against getting the shot. Now, that is not a crazy position. In fact, it's an entirely rational position, given what we know. In Ron Johnson's case, it's a much more rational position than getting a vaccine than taking medicine he doesn't need. That would be reckless and crazy. It would not be science. So this is rational. And probably because it is rational and because Ron Johnson explained his position so clearly and so calmly and with such reference to actual science, the forces of lunacy decided that they must destroy Ron Johnson before others could hear what he was saying. So here's how MSNBC responded to him last night. This is Senator Ron Johnson on Fox News tonight. People ought to respect other people's freedom and liberty and their ability to choose whether or not to get vaccinated or not. I am concerned now about them trying to push it on to children. Well, let's face it, they aren't in a position of informed consent. Uh, we do need to recognize that this is not a fully approved vaccine. Um, so, Doctor, I know uh, really smart, educated, substantial people who believe him to be a winning or unwitting asset of Russia who would sound a lot like that in American society. An asset of Russia. If you choose not to get the vaccine, even on the advice of your physician, taking medical advice from a practicing doctor, then you are working for Vladimir Putin. You're a traitor. You're doing the bidding of a foreign power. You've committed treason. Now, we should point out those words did not come from Joe Scarborough or that angry race lady who appears in the afternoons on MSNBC. No, that was Mr. Brian Williams himself, America's last living anchorman, the voice of reason, the man who calms you with the truth. Unfortunately, he too has gone insane, as if so many. Here's some guy in CNN calling for people who haven't been vaccinated to be arrested if they try to enter public buildings. Is that my concern anymore, that someone who's chosen to be unvaccinated is making a bad choice? And question two is, maybe there should be laws that allow them to be kept out of the building. Well, you hit right on the point, John. How do we get to a point where we get everyone to be as safe as possible? Maybe there should be laws that allow them to be kept out of the building, says the Dumbo on TV. They'll say anything. What's amazing is the response from Joe Biden's cabinet secretary. Oh, good point. Oh, good point, Dumbo. You'd like to think that we will look back on all of this and we're saving the tape for this eventuality and laugh someday. But we're starting to wonder if that day will ever come. Maybe the fear will never go away. Maybe it's too useful. Maybe anyone who asks questions will be called an agent of Russia or China or Syria or whatever. Who knows where this is going? Glenn Greenwald has thought a lot about it. He's a journalist. You can find his work on Substack. He is, by the way, one of the world's living experts on the heretofore hidden nexus between the Kremlin and vaccine hesitancy. And so we're happy to have him on tonight. Glenn, thanks so much for coming out. Is Putin against the COVID vaccine? I hadn't heard that before. I mean, this is illustrative, Tucker, of the fact of two things in liberal culture, of which obviously MSNBC and CNN are a major part. One is it has become a completely tyrannical movement. They don't believe in free speech. They want everyone who disagrees with them censored off the internet or kicked off people. They don't believe in due process. They constantly declare people guilty of crimes for which there's no evidence based solely on accusations. And here, they're essentially trying to force people to give up control over their bodily autonomy, once a leading value in American liberalism, by claiming that they have no right to wait for themselves for cost and risk of taking a vaccine. I got vaccinated after spending a lot of time reading everything I could and listening to experts, including my own physician, and made my own decision, and everyone else should have that right. But the other part of this is this coercive tactic that they
this is a much longer conversation. I hope someday we can sit down for an hour and talk about it. But I just it's coming out left. Like, Kamala's just asking you, what is this fixation with Russia? We've been talking about this for five years now. I've never been to Russia. Don't know that much about Russia. Their hatred of Russia seems so disproportionate to Russia's actual influence in the world. I'm starting to wonder, what is this about? Do you have any idea? I mean, there's a lot of literature on the ability to use paranoia and tribal fears in order to manipulate people. You know, when Obama used to be pressured by, like, Mark Rubio and McCain and the Hawks and the Democratic Party, the Democrats used to say, Russia's not a, a, a scary power. It's, they have an economy smaller than Italy. They're like a regional power at best. And yet in the Democratic Party mind, Vladimir Putin is like Darth Vader. Russia is an existential threat. They've contaminated and infiltrated institutions. They're deliberately stoking this fear constantly among their liberal flock because doing so keeps them frightened. And keeping them frightened means that they're more submissive and more malleable to control. That's really what it's about. But they really do believe it. It's not like they're faking it. They've all worked themselves into this mania over a country that has no, is not threatening the United States on any level. I know. It's like. Making us afraid of Burundi or something. It's so weird. I gotta go see Russia sometime. They're making me want to go there. Glenn Greenwald, thank you so much, as always. I hope we see you soon. Good to see you, Tucker. Thanks. So finally, after more than a year, we've all known this is true for a long time, for a year. But the New York Times is now acknowledging that actually you can't really get corona outside. Turns out the CDC has been lying to you about outdoor coronavirus transmissions. A month ago, the CDC informed the public that, quote, less than 10% of COVID-19 transmission was occurring outdoors. The CDC used that number to continue recommending mask wearing outside, including at concerts and sporting events, even for people who are fully vaccinated. And that's one of the main reasons that kids across the country have been forced to wear masks even when they're exercising. This Walpole soccer team is getting in some practice, masks and all. It's cool today, but their coach is worried about warmer weather. We took it a 90-degree day, mm-hmm. and the, you know, the side effects of wearing a mask and having our young kids running around that temperature is it's really not worth it. So why would you put a child in a mask outside while exercising? So obviously unhealthy, so clearly bad for the child. Well, because people believe the CDC that you should wear a mask outside. After all, 10% of COVID transmission occurred outdoors, and that's a lie. But it wasn't true. Now the New York Times is reporting, finally, that it was a lie. The agency's numbers, the Times writes, quote, appears to be based partly on a misclassification of some COVID transmission that actually took place in enclosed spaces. Enclosed spaces meaning indoors. In addition, CDC officials, quote, picked a benchmark 10% so high that nobody could reasonably dispute it. Why would they do that? In real life, experts say the total share of corona transmission that occurs indoors is actually below 1% and could be as low as 0.1%, basically none. Globally, studies have shown the same thing. The biggest study today in China showed that. We ignored it for a year. According to the Times, quote, saying less than 10% of COVID transmission occurs outdoors is akin to saying that sharks attack fewer than 20,000 swimmers a year. (laughs) The actual number worldwide is about 150. So it's both true but deceiving. The question is, why didn't they correct it? Dr. Jay Bhattacharya is a professor of medicine at Stanford and one of the authors of The Great Barrington Declaration, which is great, and you ought to read. Doctor, thanks so much for joining us tonight. So th- this is something that I think you and I have discussed on the air. It's certainly widely known that the actual documented outdoor transmission of COVID is, is rare. The CDC has misled us intensely. Not why? I, I mean, I think part of it is they're just way too cautious. They think that there's no harm from overestimating the risk and as, as if they were as if you know causing fear in the population of walking outside is no harm. It's just a strange, strange kind of risk perception. Um, and it undermines the trust that people have in public health, which is in many ways incredibly unfortunate. I mean, they sold us, they told us lockdowns were necessary to, to stop the disease from spreading. They told us that mass mandates, lifting them was Neanderthal thinking. I mean, I think all of these things serve to undermine public health, the trust in public health. I think it's very, very unfortunate. It's what's so interesting though is to contrast it with the way the CDC and the public health authorities have handled other epidemics. The, the AIDS-